morning. morning. Happy Memorial Day weekend. (laughs) Happy Memorial Day weekend. (laughs) Woo, y'all already started celebrating, hadn't you? All right, grab your Bibles, open to Romans chapter 1. We are in a series uh, called the BRP Summer Series where we are addressing from the pulpit what we will be reading next week. This coming week you will start the book of Romans. And uh, so we're, I'm sharing from Romans chapter 1. Um, but sometimes the study of Scripture is a lot like buying a piece of land. Uh, you, you decide, man, I want to buy a piece of land. I even want to buy a house, whatever it is. You start online and you get this big picture perspective, like usually an aerial shot uh, of what it looks like. Something, maybe a satellite view or a drone, but it shows you the big picture. You can see uh, some things from that, right? You can tell uh, if a piece of land has water on it, what's been cleared, what hasn't been cleared, but you really can't get the details. And to be honest, not many people would look at an aerial shot of a piece of land and go, I just got to have that. Uh, the next step would be, I got to go walk that land. And so you contact a realtor and you go out and you, you walk the land. When you walk the land, you start seeing the reality of it, right? This is good soil. This will produce fruit. This is hard soil. It's going to take a lot of work. But you, you start making decisions about what is really good about the land and what's going to be really difficult about the land. And then you make the decision to buy it. So you buy a piece of land. Now watch this. Owning a land does not produce, owning a piece of land does not produce fruit. You just own it. Right? Sometimes just owning it can be a headache. Right? If you want the land to produce fruit, you have to work it. And working it, there's going to be some places on that land that are really rich soil and they're easy to work. You just go in, you could almost just throw seed down and go, look what happened. And you love those pieces of the land because they're easy. They're easy. There are other places you got to pull stumps out and dig rocks up, and the work is hard to get the fruit. But this truth is always, it's always there. The greater the work, the greater the fruit. Bible studies like that, right? Today, what we're going to do, the book of Romans, we're going to take that aerial shot. We're going we're gonna to look at the big picture of the book of Romans. Then this week, you start the hard work of tilling the soil. And here's what's going to happen. As you dig into the book of Romans, you're going to come across some scripture and you're going to go, that is the best thing ever. That is so good. It's because it's easy for you. It's truth you already know. It's truth you already love. It's comforting. Nothing wrong with that. It's just low-hanging fruit of the spiritual tree. But there's going to be some stuff in this book that is hard for you. Some of the stuff in this book may challenge you. Well, that's the tough work. That's where you have to start digging in. But the truth is the same. The greater the work, the greater the fruit. The greater the work, the greater the fruit. So read with me, if you will, now. Chapter 1, verse 1, the first 17 verses. Just be patient as we read through this this morning. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's just a really wordy introduction. Right? Who I, I'm Paul, and God's really good, and I'm writing to you. And that's it. Right? A lot of big words in there. Paul kind of got lost in that. And then we pick up in verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being proclaimed through the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you, always in my prayers, making a request that perhaps now at last, by the will of God, I may get to, I succeed and come to you. Okay? Making it easy to understand. I want to come see you. I want to come see you. Super easy to understand. That's all he's saying. He, and, and really what he's saying is, I've tried to come see you, but I've been prevented from come seeing you, and I'm hoping now, because I've been praying for you, that I finally get to come see you. See you, verse 11. This is where we're going to find our application in this passage. 11 through 17, there are three things that Paul says that when he comes to see them and in the writing of this letter that he wants to accomplish, and here they are. 
For I long to see you that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I have often planned to come to you and have been prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I'm under obligation both to the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. So for my part, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are also at Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you for uh, the people we've got to meet with today. I pray that you'd speak to us, that, uh, Father, that uh, you, would, you would stir our hearts with this message. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. So when you begin a study of any book in Scripture, you need to understand the context. And context is a little bit boring, but it makes all the difference in the world. And I'm amazed at people who study Scripture and never understand the context. So I'm going to read you something kind of out of context, and uh, you'll be very familiar with it. But I'm going to read it like maybe you don't know it. You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why Santa's coming to town. He sees you when you're sleeping, getting creepy. Right? I mean, you think if it has no context, you're like, who is this Santa guy? I'm loading my gun, right? Because you don't have the context. In context that we've grown up with this, this song and we know who Santa is, that's a very pleasant song, a very happy song, but out of context... You really don't know what it's saying. So it is with God's word. If you don't know the context, you have no earthly idea what it's saying. And so we're going to start by trying to put this in context and uh, understand first who wrote the book. Well, the first word of the first verse tells us Paul wrote the book. So why did he tell them with the first word that he wrote it? Because he probably didn't write it. He had a secretary right? Uh, he actually identifies him as a guy named Tertius in the book. Tertius wrote this. We know from 1 Corinthians that Paul had a vision problem. He could not see very well, so he seldom wrote with his own hand. And when he did, he says, you can see I have written this with my own hand. So the handwriting didn't look like Paul's. And so Paul identifies himself at the beginning of the book and identifies Tertius as the writer of the book. And so we need to understand a little bit about Paul to understand the book. Paul's a really interesting character. Fortunately, the Bible gives us a lot of info about him. Born a Jew. Born a Jew who became a Pharisee. And some would tell you that he could have been in line to be the chief priest. Right? He talks about his life as a Jew. He was, by his own description, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He says in Philippians chapter five or three, verses five and six, he said, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was educated at the feet of one of the most famous Jewish rabbis, a guy named Gamaliel. He goes on to say, touching the law, I was a Pharisee concerning zeal. I persecuted the church. Touching righteousness, which can be found in the law, I was blameless. Stop and look at me. Do you understand what he is saying? That he's either a madman or he was the most perfect human being who ever walked the face of the earth. I am blameless when it comes to keeping the 613 laws of the Old Testament and all the oral traditions that flowed out of them. Who could ever have possibly said that? Well, Paul says, man, that was me. That was my life. I, I lived from a Jewish perspective, a perfect, blameless life. So much so that when this guy named Jesus shows up, and he's a threat to Judaism, Paul felt like it was his moral obligation to take out anybody who followed him. And he did. So again, look right here at me, understand context. The man who wrote these words murdered Christians. We don't know how many Christians. We know he did murder them. He tortured them. He drugged them out of their houses and he threw them into prisons. Men, women, families. He tells us that. In Acts chapter 22, verse 4, I persecuted this way until death, binding and delivering into prisons. 
both men and women. Paul was ambitious. He had goals in this life. He was rising up through the Jewish ranks. But you know what? God does some crazy stuff with our ambitions, doesn't he? He will redirect our paths. He redirected my path in life. I'm glad he did. I'm glad he didn't let me pursue the path I wanted to pursue. So one day, Paul on the road to Damascus, going to persecute the church, going to kill some more Christians, and a weird thing happens. The sky splits open. And there's this bright, bright light, and there's this booming voice that sounds like thunder. And Paul doesn't know what it is, and he falls on his face on the ground, puts his face in the dirt, and he says, tell me who you are. And that voice says, I am Jesus. I'm the Jesus you are persecuting. Now get up. Make your way into town. I got somebody waiting to meet you. Now watch this. That introduction to Jesus changed his life forever. He was nothing like he used to be, right? So he was blameless according to the law. He was a slave to the law. Do you know that most often way that Paul ever introduced himself was no longer slave of law, but slave of Jesus? Five times. Five times in the New Testament, he introduced himself as the servant or the slave of Jesus Christ. He used to be the slave of the law, right? He spent his life trying to be good enough to work his way up to God, right? I'm climbing. I'm working. I'm trying to be good enough. I'm trying to do a lot. Now, listen, if that's you and you're here today, understand you're on the same road Paul was on. It's a horrible road because you can't ever do enough. See, if Paul was perfect, why didn't he stop? But he couldn't. He had to keep trying to be better and better and better and better, keeping more and more and more rules. And then all of a sudden, after that encounter with Jesus, he realized that it was grace that brought God down to him. Changed his life forever. The guy who hated the church and tried to destroy it now becomes a guy who's concerned about growing the church and the health of the church. Everything about his life changed. Paul saw God differently. But when we meet Jesus, we also see ourselves differently. So look at me, make sure you get it, because some of you here, this is going to ring a bell with. Prior to meeting Jesus, this is what Paul would say about himself. I'm a good guy. Now, he said it this way. I'm blameless concerning the law, right? I'm righteous, Pharisee of Pharisees, Hebrew Hebrews. I'm a good guy. He meets Jesus, and his description of himself changes. First Timothy I am the chief of all sinners. How do you know you've met Jesus? You're going to view God differently, and you're going to view yourself differently, right? Because you can't, you can't have a Savior until you know you're a sinner. And when Paul, when he saw himself, he said, man, I am the chief of all sinners, Paul, and I love this about him, could write so eloquently about sin, and he does. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But he also could write eloquently about drinking deeply from the fountain of grace because he had done both. Chief of all sinners and blessed by the grace of Jesus. So then where and, and to whom was this book written? Well, it was written to the Romans. Uh, we know that. The letter is titled, the book, the letter to the Romans. Acts chapter 20, verse 3 tells us that Paul was in Greece, specifically Corinth, for three months. He stayed at the home of a Christian man named Gaius. And from Gaius' home, he wrote the letter, 1 Corinthians. Now, let's stop for a second. What do we know about Corinth? We know that Corinth was a horrible city where people gave themselves over completely to their desires, right? Do anything morally, anything at all. So Paul walks the streets of Corinth, and man, it's just, it's all over him. Sin everywhere. And so what does he write about a lot in Romans? He writes about sin. A matter of fact, he's going to write so openly about sin that it will cause some of us to become uncomfortable. It will challenge us, right? He's going to write about your moral life. He's going to write about homosexuality. No other writer does it. He uncovers his own struggle with sin to the point that it makes most Christians uncomfortable. You go, what well, doesn't make me uncomfortable? How about this one? The things I want to do, I don't. And the things I don't want to do, I do. Well, there'd be a lot of Christians who'd say, well, you're not even a Christian if that's true. You mean you're still doing things you, you don't want to do? Now, there'll be another part of us that go, hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> right? I fall in that camp, by the way. 
I just need you to know that you're gonna, there's, that's going to be one of those spots in Scripture when you read it that you're going to have to work harder to understand. But in writing transparently about his own sin, here's what he's going to challenge us to do. Deal with your sin. Deal with your sin. What I know to be true about me is also true about you. Deal with your own sin. Chapter 1, verse 7 tells us Paul wrote to the church at Rome, to the saints at Rome. We know very little about the church. We don't even know how it started. We assume from Acts chapter 2, verse 10, that at Pentecost, people went out sharing the gospel of Jesus. We know from what Paul said from his own testimony in Romans chapter 15, verse 20, that no apostle had gone there because he said, I want to go share the gospel where no man has ever shared. I want to go to Rome. So that's what we know about Rome. Context. Who wrote the book? Who it was written to? Why? Why was this book written? And there are three things, and this is where our application comes from today, um, that Paul wrote about and that he wants to accomplish. Number one, he says, I, I want to come so I can give you something. So I can give you something. That's a great thing to say. He, he explains it in verse 11. He says, I, I want to give you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Well, Men do not give spiritual gifts. God does. And so he's not saying, I'm coming to give you a spiritual gift, line up, and I'll bestow them on you. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, God gave me a spiritual gift, just like he gave you a spiritual gift. And when I come, I want to use the spiritual gift that God gave me to strengthen you, help you, build you up. I want to bring something in me. That opens up an entirely new perspective on our lives. So what if I told you that God gave you something to give that would never run out? Listen, get this, never, never, never. That the more you gave it away, the better it would get. And the more of it you would have, and the more you'd want to give it away. And you could just, by the way, get this, write this down. You were created to give, and if you're living to get, you're missing your life. You were never put on this earth to get. You are created to give by God. And so he gives us these things, intangible things that don't cost any money. And he puts us here and he says, now give it away. Give it away as much as you can. And if you give it away, I'll give you more. And we get stuck on, oh man, I don't have any money to give. Well, the first thing we give is what God has given us. Our spiritual gifts. So how does that look? How does that look? So play, play this out in your, in your mind with me. When you came to church today, was the first thing on your mind, what can I give? Then I'm going to show up today and I want to give something and go, what would that practically look like? I will promise you that today somebody walked in and they're hanging on by a thread. And they needed a word of encouragement. Did you show up to give it? Did you look at your life and go, God, you... You've given me a spiritual gift. And I'm a, I want my spiritual radar on today. And when I walk in the building, please show me. Show me somebody, God, that's hanging on by a thread. Because I got something to give them, God. How many people do you think are here who need to be prayed for? That the bottom is falling out for them. And you got the gift of intercession and you're sitting on it? It never crossed your mind to tell God, God, give me eyes to see. Let me see them so that when I show up, I got something to give. No, no, God, I, I, I need to get something today. We're going to get to getting. But I'm telling you, you weren't created to get. You were created to give, and that's why it comes up first. You know there's somebody who wants to come to your house? People got to get to hospitality. You always want to invite somebody over. But here's what we do. We get stuck inviting the same group of people over all the time. You know, hospitality means to invite the stranger in. When was the last time you had somebody in your house for the first time? Because I promise you, there's lonely people sitting in the pews at church that would give anything to have an invite to your house. Generosity. Hey, listen, I'll just be straight up honest with you. There's a very small percentage of people at this church that struggle financially. Everybody else here, consider yourself blessed. And what do we do? All we can think about is what else am I going to get with it? How about you show up like this? 
I'm going to look for a single dad. I'm going to look for a single mom. I'm going to look for somebody struggling today. And God, you show them to me. You put them on my spiritual radar, God, and I'm going to bless them today. Because I got something to give. Spiritual gift. Spiritual gift. So here's a challenge. Before you get out of the building today, would you ask that question? He said, Pastor, I don't know what my spiritual gift is. The road.tv backslash gifts. Go find it. We put all the resources out there for you. We talk about this all the time. Pick it up. Do it. Now, maybe you understand why it's important. This is why you were created. And Paul said, man, I want to show up in Rome because I got something to give you that God gave me. But then he said, I got, I'm coming to Rome to get something. He says that we may be encouraged by each other's faith in verse 12. So understand this, that showing up to give something opens the door to get something. If all you ever do is show up to get something, you become like a stagnant pond. That water is always flowing into, never flowing out of. And I will promise you, it will sour. This is what it sounds like. Well, I ain't getting enough anymore. Right? Well, I'll tell you what. The Mississippi River could be flowing into your life, and it ain't enough because you weren't created to get. You were created to give. You were created to give. And as we give, we open the door up to receive. So i got a question for you. How many OU fans are here? Okay, I'm going to count. Okay, i got a pretty good idea. Okay, put them down. How many OSU fans? OSU went, has won every service. And all of our heathens must be OU fans. <laughs> that must be it. Uh, predominantly OSU fans. Okay, how many of you, third question, I'm not a fan of sports at all. Okay, you're the happiest people in the room. <laughs> I'm going to show you why. Show you why. OU goes and plays ball game Saturday afternoon, Saturday night. Next day you come to church. You look at somebody you know and you go, man, somebody in your family die? No, you got beat. Right? Oh, you got beat. I... OSU fan? Man, you okay? I don't know what's wrong with Gundy. I just, I don't, I, why? They should have done this, should have done that. Right? And all frustrated, life's all upside down. But, but the pers people that raise their hands and go, I don't care. They got um, Somebody goes, you know oh, you lost? Who cares? I'm having a great day. <laughs> you with me? What you value determines what you celebrate. And God forbid the greatest thing you value in life is a sports team. Are you with me? Luke chapter 15 verse 7 says this, that when one sinner repents, one, heaven loses its mind. Why? Look at me. Because heaven values spiritual things. I got a letter from a lady this week. It was actually a Facebook message, but I'm going to read it to you. She was in the last service. She's 66 years old. I love it when senior adults still want to know God. Because, man, something happens. We get old and we quit. We quit. I love it when senior adults want to know God. So listen to this. She said, I want to let you know how much the Bible reading plan has meant to my husband and I. We started it when the church started it. And we've always read, but we never wrote anything down or really shared our thoughts. It's, it's been amazing. There have even been times in reading when we thought, there's just nothing there. And then the words would begin to flow and we would fill up a page. Uh, we'd read them to each other. Amazing how God teaches each of us something different. We've both grown so much since we started this. At first, we thought, I don't want to write anything down. So did I, right? I didn't like it either. But that's the key. And she said, scripture memory. She said, wow. She said, I've always memorized regular verses. Look up here at me. Regular verses, John 3, 16, right? Maybe Psalm 23. I love this one when your favorite verse is Jesus wept, right? <laughs> it's easy. It's your favorite verse, Jesus wept. Everybody knows that one, two words, right? So here, here's what that is. That, that is mediocre Christianity, that says I'm 60 years old, and the only verse I know is John 3, 16. What? What? This lady says, that was me. But about two years ago, she said, I started memorizing Scripture. She said, I have memorized the entire fifth chapter of Matthew at 66 years old. 
She said, it's amazing uh, how much we have grown um, these words of Jesus. I may not say each word perfectly, but there's not a day that something happens and one of these verses does not pop in my head. I even lay down at night and say them to myself to help me go to sleep. And I'm going to tell you, if you're a pastor, that blesses your soul. If you're a follower, it should bless your soul, right? So you look around the room and you see people who didn't know God, and now they do. And Paul would go, and that's why we do what we do, and that's what makes life worth living. You see couples that were falling apart, and they put back together, and God put them together, and you go, I find great joy in that. You see kids who were far from God, and they come back to God. Your kids got good godly foundations in their marriages. You thank God for that, and you find great joy in those things because you value spiritual things. Paul said, I came to give something. I came to get something, and what I came to get is joy from your spiritual growth. And the last thing, Paul said, I came to share something. He came to share the gospel, but he came to share it in two ways. He came to share it first with the saved. In chapter 15, he writes, verse 15, that I came to share with you to remind you of the tenets of your faith, what the gospel is about. So what does he write about? He writes about sin. He writes about grace. He writes about salvation. He writes about God loving us while we were yet his enemies, all these things. So I got a couple questions for you. How long has it been since your salvation was as big to you as the day you got saved? I cried the day I got saved, like a baby. I can't tell you how long it's been since I cried about something spiritual. Sin? Do you remember how big your sin was the day you met Jesus? How long has it been since it's been that big to you again? Grace. Just how good God's grace is. And Paul understands the nature of our humanity. He's not, he's not mad at people. He's just saying, listen, one of the things I want to share with you, I want to share with you is about salvation, just to remind you how good it really is. Maybe that's you today. But the second thing he says, I want to share salvation, the message of salvation with the lost people at Rome too, right? Right? I want, to, I want to reap a spiritual harvest there. And I think it's interesting how the Bible deals with saved people versus lost people. The Bible has some pretty stern stuff to say to people who follow Jesus. It's got some pretty cool stuff to say to lost people, mostly about the love of God. The love of God. And when Jesus talked to lost people, most often he told them these incredible stories that demonstrated God's love. And he used the word lost over and over again. As a matter of fact, one chapter in Luke, he tells three stories. And, and all of them have to do with something that's lost. How long has it been since you, in your perspective, saw your opportunity to share Jesus as the opportunity to help God get back what he lost? God is in heaven, and he wanted this relationship with us, and he lost it. Sin took it, and he's been on this mission to get this relationship with you back, and he will do anything to get it, even if it's the life of his son. I'm going to help you put this in perspective. I'm going to tell you a story. A few years ago, somebody at this church, I don't know who, nominated my wife and I uh, for pastor of the month in a local radio contest. Uh, and we won. And they called us up and they go, we have uh, a little weekend romantic getaway for you at this bed and breakfast. And we were like, Wow. So we show up to bed and breakfast, and man, it's nice. There's a big old giant tub in the middle of the bath, uh, bedroom, and bathroom's where it should be, right? <laughs> but in the middle of the bedroom, it was really, really elegant. And the next morning, they came out with, uh, knocked on our door. We peek out, and there's this huge breakfast sitting there. And it was super, super nice. And we were going to make a big deal out of it. And so we were going to dress up and, you know, make a big weekend out of it. And uh, when my daddy died, uh, he passed on to us some jewelry that had been that he had had and, and he wanted it passed on to grandkids and and one of the things was a diamond pendant and diamond stud earrings they were pretty big and my sister got the pendant and my family was to get the diamond earrings and uh, he gave them to mama and mama called Steph one day and she said come over here she said I'm gonna give you these diamond earrings and said I, I want you to wear them but when you get to this point in life I'm in I want you to give them to Bree. 
and she can pass them on to her family. And, and Steph brought those earrings home, and she said to me, I'll never wear these things because as sure as I wear them, I'll lose one of them. And so th this is for your, your daughter and, and your daddy's grandkid, and, and I want her to get them, and I'm, I, they'll, they'll, we put them in the safe. Well, it's a big weekend. We're going to dress up. And uh, I said, get them earrings out. I don't want to wear the earrings. Get the earrings out, babe. Put them earrings on. She put them earrings on, man. And we go up and we have our, our weekend. And we get in the car to come home. And we're driving home. And she reaches up and she feels of her ear. And she says, the earring's gone. And there was a few moments of, I told you this was going to happen. <laughs> there were a few of them. But panic set in. Panic set in. And panic set in in my life, not because I lost an earring, but because somebody I love lost an earring. And we turned the car around. And we went back to that bed and breakfast, and I ran into that office. I said, have you cleaned that room? And they said, no. I said, give me a key. We lost something, and it must be found. And we got on our hands and knees. And we went around. You thought I was going to say prayed. We didn't pray. <laughs> We got on our hands and knees, and we went around on that carpet on our hands and knees, and we felt on that carpet, and we found that earring. We found that, and there was great, great celebration. <laughs> now watch, watch. What did Jesus say? I lost somebody. Would you help me find them? And when we find them, there is great celebration great celebration all of that mattered to me only because of the woman I love lost people should matter to you because of the father you love and if you love him it shows up because you help him find what he lost would you bow your heads with me today We show up to give something. Uh, we show up to get something. We show up to share something. I, I want to ask you to, to please ask God right now that before you get out of this building, would he show you the opportunity to give someone something, right? Whatever your spiritual gift is, mercy, generosity, intercession, service, helps, teaching, whatever it is, wisdom. Say, God, would you let me give somebody something before I leave today? I, I don't want to just show up to get. I want to give something. Second thing, what, what do you have because you value spiritual things that you can rejoice about today? Somebody you love come to know Jesus and they're sitting in a pew by you. And have you ever just said, thank you, God? You got kids that came to know Jesus? You got a parent that came to know Jesus? You got something to share. Maybe you needed to have the tenets of your faith revisited today and remember what it felt like that moment you met Jesus how big sin was and how refreshing grace looked. Or maybe there's somebody out there and God would whisper in your ear, would you help me find them? Would you help me get back what I lost? I do not know what God may have said to you today, but this is our opportunity to respond to him. Whatever that may look like in your life, if you're looking for a church home, make the decision to follow. Whatever it would be, this is your moment. Father, thank you so much for the time you've given us. God, please speak clearly. And Father, uh, may the day be a day of great joy in our lives because of what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen.